In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Luke. When some were talking about the temple, remarking how it was adorned with fine stone work and votive offerings, Jesus said, All these things you are starting or staring at now, the time will come when not a single stone will be left on another. Everything will be destroyed. And they put to him this question, Master, they said, when will this happen then? And what sign will there be that this is about to take place? Take care not to be deceived, he said, because many will come using my name and saying I am he, and the time is near at hand. Refuse to join them. And when you hear of wars and revolutions, do not be afraid, for this is something that must happen, but the end is not so soon. Then he said to them, Nation will fight against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. There will be great earthquakes and plagues and famines here and there. There will be fearful sights and great signs from heaven. But before all this happens, men will seize you and persecute you. They will hand you over to the synagogues and to imprisonment, and bring you before kings and governors because of my name. And that will be your opportunity to bear witness. Keep this carefully in mind. You are not to prepare your defense, because I myself shall give you an eloquence and a wisdom that none of your opponents will be able to resist or to contradict. You will be betrayed, even by parents and brothers, relations and friends, and some of you will be put to death. You will be hated by all men on account of my name, but not a hair of your head will be lost. Your endurance will win you your lives. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Dear God's family, dear brothers and sisters, today the church invites us to get ready for the day when Christ will introduce us into the eternal life the life with God. We have to get ready, therefore, for our individual personal death, when Christ will offer to us his salvation for the last time, for each one to accept or to reject it. Also to get ready for, for the so-called second coming of Christ at the end of the world, when all mankind, even those who go lost, will acknowledge God's wisdom, power and love in trying to save each and every person that comes into the world. All the three readings of today speak of Christ's second coming, but the lesson they convey applies equally well to our individual death. As we shall be found at our death, so shall we be found at Jesus' second coming. The book of Malachi is one of the shortest books in the Bible, just three pages. You will find it in your Bible right at the end of the Old Testament. Not that it was the last book of the Old Testament to be written, since it was written some 450 years before Jesus came into the world. But it is placed last in the Bible at the end of the so-called 12 minor prophets. We are not even sure of the name of the author of this book, since the name Malachi means my messenger. It could apply to any prophet, though it could well be the name of a particular person. In earlier explanations, we have often referred to the situation of the Jews after their return from exile. There was joy and enthusiasm among them on reaching home. They built their temple and later on the city walls. Yet their enthusiasm did not last long. For one thing, they were extremely poor. It proved extremely hard for them to start life again with their homes destroyed, their fields abandoned for years, and enemies all around harassing them continuously. And what is worse, some of their leaders led immoral lives. Worship at the temple was not conducted as it ought, and the wealthier people started oppressing the poor once again. In such a situation, 
many among the people started wondering if Yahweh's love for them was really as great as they had been told. Has Yahweh abandoned us once again? Why does he allow things to go the way they do? Has he forgotten his promises? Today's first reading, taken from the end of the book of Malachi, contains God's answer to the anguish of the people. Malachi says, A day will come, the so-called day of Yahweh, when once and for all the wickedness will be wiped out from the face of the earth. The fire will destroy both the stalk and the root of a plant, that is, wickedness will never sprout again. A day is coming, Yahweh will be at one, and at the same time, a fire that destroys the wicked, a sun that casts its beneficial rays over those who put their trust in Yahweh, and a medicine that will heal every disease in his chosen ones. So the prophet tells them, let the people keep their trust in Yahweh. They will not be disappointed. God will fulfill his promises. The prophet Malachi is well known for two announcements that he made. The first, that the glory of the temple they had rebuilt, which materially speaking stood no match with the one built by Solomon, would far exceed the glory of the first temple. When Israel least expected it, Yahweh's messenger, the Messiah, personally will come into it. Malachi wrote, The Lord you are seeking will come suddenly into his temple. The angel of the covenant whom we are longing for. Yes, he is coming, says the Lord Almighty. The church always understood this prophecy as referring to the presentation of Jesus in the temple 40 days after his birth, which Luke narrates in chapter 2, verse 38. The second announcement refers to an extraordinary sacrifice that would one day be offered throughout the world, and which would make up for the unworthy way in which the worship at the temple of Jerusalem was then being uh, conducted. So the prophet said, From the farthest east to the farthest west, my name will be honored among the nations, and everywhere a sacrifice of incense will be offered in my name, and a pure offering too. The church understood this prophecy as referring to the sacrifice of the Holy Mass. We have said that the name Malachi means my messenger. Actually, any prophet can claim that name, but there is one who fully deserves that name, namely Jesus Christ. When Malachi announced the day of Yahweh, he was referring above all to the day when the Messiah would come into the world. It was Jesus who would destroy sin through his death on the cross and keep on uprooting it from the hearts of all those who would come to believe in him. Jesus is the one who would vindicate the poor and the oppressed by giving them preference in his kingdom. This day of Yahweh, which started when Jesus came into the world, is still going on. It will end with Jesus' second coming at the end of the world. In today's Gospel, Jesus announces his second coming, together with two other events. The first, the destruction of Jerusalem and its temple. This took place some 40 years after Jesus' death. Secondly, the material destruction of the world at the end of time before he returns. Jesus announced the destruction of Jerusalem and that of the world and his second coming, all three events in a single announcement with a purpose. The destruction of Jerusalem was to be was meant to be a symbol of the material destruction of the world and these two catastrophes were meant to announce his final coming. In today's Gospel, Luke tells us how Jesus announced to his apostles the destruction of the temple as they were on the road to Bethany for the night after a strenuous day of preaching in the temple. This took place on the Tuesday after his solemn entrance into Jerusalem. Jesus would spend the whole of Wednesday at Bethany preparing for the momentous events 
which were about to take place in the next days. He would go back to the city only on Thursday evening to celebrate the Passover with his disciples and begin his passion. Jesus announced the destruction of the temple just as the apostles pointed out to him its magnificence as the mighty structure shone at the light of the setting sun. It was evening. It was beautiful. For the apostles, the announcement of the destruction of the temple was a rude shock. That temple was for all Jews the most precious treasure on earth. And they firmly believed God would protect it against all enemies. So what was the purpose of Jesus' announcement? On reading the passage of today's gospel, we are led to think that the purpose of Jesus announcing the destruction of Jerusalem and that of the world and of his final coming in such vivid terms was to frighten people out of their sins and thus lead them to repentance. This is a mistake. Jesus' intention was not so much to proclaim destruction, but to proclaim salvation. He did not do it to frighten people, but to encourage his followers to keep walking. <clears throat> In fact, Luke wrote down Jesus' prophecy of the destruction of the temple shortly before it took place. He did it to instill courage into his Christian communities, <coughs> who at the time were undergoing a severe persecution. And to that purpose, he quoted to them the following words of Jesus. When these things begin to take place, stand direct, hold your heads high, because your liberation is near at hand. In quoting these words of Jesus, Luke invited his Christians not to worry about the evils taking place around them but to look anxiously for their salvation, which Christ was bringing to them in the midst of those evils. Those Christians understood that the core of Jesus' announcement was neither the destruction of Jerusalem nor the destruction of the world, but his final coming to save them. <coughs> they were not afraid of it, but rather longed for it. In fact, their choice prayer both in private and in the celebration of the Holy Eucharist was Maranatha, an Aramaic word which the church preserved as the first Christians had pronounced it and which means, Come Lord Jesus. 1 Corinthians 16.22 and Revelation 22.20 Maranatha, Come Lord Jesus. Now the question is, how to wait for the coming of Christ? Most early Christian communities suffered from a common ailment. They had waited so eagerly for the second coming of Christ, but as years passed by, the Lord had delayed His coming, they grew discouraged or even wavered in their Christian faith. Discouragement took hold of most of them. One such community was that of Thessalonica, the, these Christians had been evangelized by Paul, but because of opposition on the part of the Jews living there, Paul had to leave them before he could impart to them even an elementary education of the faith. The Christians of Thessalonica, naturally, therefore, did not grasp well Paul's teaching regarding the second coming of Christ. At a certain moment, they thought it was so imminent that they gave up working together, working all together, and ceased to look after their daily duties. Paul wrote to them two letters in which, among other points, he corrected their wrong ideas regarding Jesus' second coming. As it could not be otherwise, Paul's teaching coincides with that of Jesus in today's gospel. So we must wait for Jesus' coming, he tells the Thessalonians, never getting tired of doing what is right. Doing what is right, meaning there is still plenty of evil in the world and therefore a lot of work to do. Our duty as Christians is to foster all that is good and eradicate evil first within us as far as possible or, and also in uh, others as far as possible. Then, we, this Paul tells them, we must wait for Jesus' coming ready to accept persecution for his, take, for his sake. 
Persecutions should not surprise us. Jesus repeatedly told us that we would be persecuted just as he had been. Rather than getting discouraged on account of persecution, we should take it as a proof that also his promise of a reward on an account of it will be fulfilled. The devil does not give up easily and hits back, but all his fury will not save him from destruction. If we persevere, triumph will eventually be ours. So Jesus says, your endurance will win you your life. And to win our life, to be saved, we have an infallible means to grow in courage as well, namely prayer. It is Jesus who points out at this infallible source of courage. Stay awake, praying at all times for the strength to survive all that is going to happen and to stand with confidence before the Son of Man. Therefore, we must wait for Jesus coming with complete trust in him. We are never alone in this struggle. Christ is always by our side. He is an expert in the war against the devil whom he completely defeated on the cross. No army general ever sent his troops into battle with a more firm reassurance of triumph than Jesus Christ. Not a hair of your head will be lost, he promised them. Not a hair on their head will be lost. And so we pray, Father in heaven, we are grateful to the Holy Spirit who at all times goes on repairing the havoc that sin has caused in us. Increase our trust in the power and the goodness of your Son Jesus and fill us with a longing for his second coming. He who live and reign with you and the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. The Lord be with you. And may Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Let us bless the Lord. Live in Jesus, live in me by Jesus, we believe in Jesus, feel of me. Live in Jesus, live in me by Jesus, we believe in Jesus, feel of me. Oh, we love the lover of God, we pray to Mary, help of Christians. Lover of God, pray to Mary, help of Christians. Live in Jesus, live in Viva Jesus, Viva, live in Jesus, feel of the Live in Jesus, live in Viva Jesus, Viva, live in Jesus, feel of the hour.